In this video, I wanted to do things a little bit differently because we've been making videos which give you all of the advice and tools in order to be a successful artist when marketing your music. But putting it into practice is a little bit more difficult. So what we decided to do was put up an Instagram story where you could submit your marketing strategy, your Instagram profile, your TikToks, and all of your other social medias. And then we could analyze them in real time and give you advice. So not only will you get value from submitting, but also you'll be able to see by watching what other artists are doing the common mistakes and how to actually put our advice into practice. So today I've just picked a few emails at random. If this is a popular video, if everybody loves this kind of style, I've got tons more emails from that Instagram story that we put up. So there'll be plenty more episodes just like it. So regardless whether you liked it, didn't like it, neutral, comment below. Let us know if you like this style of video. The first email is from Luke Clerken and he has sent a pretty basic email just linking his Instagram and his Facebook and also just telling us a little bit about what he's done so far. As you can see from the email, he's done lots of different things like he's done a Spotify for artists, made sure that he has submitted via that platform to get his music to the curators. He set up pre-save competitions. Um, with pre-save competitions, I actually love them in principle, but I always feel like with a pre-save competition, you need such a big prize and huge incentive to get people to pre-save your track. For me, I understand what the benefit of a pre-save campaign is because you're getting people to save on release day and it helps the algorithm. If you have an audience that is engaged enough and you think you can get thousands of saves, then that's amazing. That is going to help the algorithm from day one and hopefully get onto Discover Weekly Playlist in a matter of weeks. It speeds up the process. The problem with pre-saves is it devalues your content. So if you're constantly trying to get to people to pre-save, there's no way of adding value and asking people to pre-save your track in the same post. And it's not even a very exciting thing to announce that you've got a pre-save. It's not like you've got a new track out and all your fans can go and rush and stream it. So if you're an emerging artist, you don't have a huge fan base and they're not hugely engaged, then I wouldn't recommend going for a pre-save campaign. I would recommend that just sacrificing a little bit of that early algorithm push and going for promoting your music post-release and all of the people that would have pre-saved your track, they will still, still go and stream your track. So pre-release, create amazing content, content that is gonna get people engaged, potentially grow your audience on Instagram, and then once you have people engaged, then you can start pushing your music once it is released. And if you look at other industries, whether it's YouTubers, the fitness industry, you can see that they do this. They don't tease releases of videos anymore. That's kind of a very old school way of teasing releases. Now I recommend simply just getting your music out there, announcing it, getting people streaming it, showing people that you're an amazing talented artist and worth coming back again when you announce the next thing and just keep growing it that way because otherwise you're flooding your Instagram with content that is not engaging, it's not enjoyable for the user and people don't come back. So when you do have a release, you've already diluted your content and you haven't got any engagement and then people don't go and stream your track. So be very careful with what you're putting out there and what you could be potentially sacrificing with your audience in terms of just getting a few pre-saves. So Luke has also asked if there's anything that we think he's doing wrong. So pre-save competitions, that's definitely something to think about. Let's take a look at his Instagram. Okay, so immediately looking at Luke's Instagram, couple of things spring to mind. One is 27 posts. That's not enough posts to get any followers. I'm actually surprised you've managed to get as many as 2000 plus followers. I'm not sure if you followed and unfollowed or if you found another way to get followers or perhaps something else is driving followers to your account. But for me, there's not enough content there for people to have followed and I would be surprised if you've got huge amounts of engagement. So I've just switched to an incognito window to have a look at the engagement, and yeah, the engagement isn't high enough for 2,100 followers. So however you've managed to get your followers, 
they're not engaging. They haven't followed for your content. And I'm not really surprised with only 27 posts and not a lot of, of variation. There's not something interesting worth following. Then you're not going to be able to get engaged followers. So having a look at your captions, just moving back to non incognito, having a look at some of your captions, it is primarily looking to be about the music. So this one especially is just about releasing music and pre-saving the track. This is announcement of the track. And then finally, yeah, again, pre-saving the track and asking people to pre-save the track. I'm assuming that this was what you meant by a pre-save competition. So you're offering people the opportunity for a personalized song. But if you're only getting 40 to 60 likes, then this isn't a engaged of enough audience to be able to do that. So I would focus more if, if you are going to do a personalized song, which is gonna take a lot of effort, something you can do is instead of creating a personalized song for a fan, per, create a personalized song for someone with an audience. So find accounts with anywhere between 5,000 to 100,000 followers and make personalized songs about them, about what they do and make the song specifically for them. And then simply put it on your Instagram story and then tag them in it. Or you could put it on your feed. And what will happen is the influencer, if they like it, they will share it. And this works amazingly because they've shared your content onto their feed and then people will click through to see who has made that. And that is exposure for you. But when you get exposure on this channel, we give you a lot of tips for exposure, but you need to make sure that when you do get it, your content is good enough for people to click follow. So make sure you are creating consistent content that people are going to want to follow and you are ready to be able to get that traffic first. When you're creating that personalized song, something I've just thought of is don't be afraid to post it twice. So you're able to see whether, if you, especially if you post it in, uh, to in, Instagram stories. If you post to Instagram stories, you can see whether that influencer saw it or not. If they did see it and they didn't decide to share it, then unfortunately it wasn't good enough or it wasn't something that they want to share. I would be surprised if they don't share it. And the reason is because influencers are desperate for posts. The more Instagram stories that they can put up, the more engagement they get. And also they get put to the front of people are getting to the, to the end of that their Instagram stories. So getting to the end of the stories gets them more views. They want more views, more things to post, and you're giving, giving that to them. So if they haven't viewed it, unfortunately they were away, they were traveling, something came up and they didn't come on Instagram that day, post it again. You've only got uh, 60 engaged followers, so it doesn't really matter. Post it again a week later and uh, until the day that they see it and then they potentially share it and just keep doing it and eventually you will grow and get more followers. So the next email is from Nilo Griffin, who is a Paris-based Paris based singer songwriter. And he has asked to basically, again, look through his general strategy and he says that his content is about music, self-discovery and human connection, which I really like. That gives people an idea of things to expect around the music. So you're not just gonna be talking about your music. It's not just gonna be plugging your tracks. There are things that are going to be happening surrounding it. So he also says that he's created a vlog on YouTube, which he is using to promote himself. I love the idea of having other places other than Instagram to be able to get people to become fans and initially discover you. So Instagram is actually one of the most difficult places to get discovered. It's not really a great tool for discovery. It doesn't have an algorithm that has the explore page, but it's not that good for music. What I would recommend is looking at other platforms such as YouTube and TikTok that do have that discovery algorithm. And then you can drive people to your Instagram and keep them there as well. Okay, so let's have a look at Nilo's Instagram to start with then. So already I'm liking the look of this profile. So I like the bio. And again, it's about self-discovery, human connection, as well as the music and the bio's got a few emojis in it, but the thing is about those emojis is you're saying that you do French and English content. I wouldn't do this. We get this question a lot 
from artists on whether they should create content in English or their own language. And I would say, pick one. Pick the one where you think you have the biggest potential fan base and then grow from there. I would personally choose English, but I would, yeah, I'd lean towards English. And the reason for that is because from the people I've met, the French people I've met, most of them can speak English and are used to consuming English content as well as French content. I'm not saying all of them do, but a, a large proportion of them do. And English people, we suck at other languages. We don't, we don't speak other languages. We're very ignorant to it, but we are getting better, but certainly not enough to be able to consume someone else's content in another language. So I would lean towards English, but if French is your thing and you, you are Paris based, then you can choose French as well, whichever works for you. As for the profile picture, again, I like it. This is what I was explaining earlier. I like the headshot because it is recognizable. This one, unfortunately, it doesn't stand out. You don't stand out. So it won't be effective when people are searching Instagram or having a look at who has posted on their Instagram stories. Looking at your content, I, I like it. It's very varied. It looks like there is likely a story behind every single post. So if I click something, I am expecting some kind of caption or something where you're going to be telling a story. So what you're doing is you're putting up posts in both English and French. If you aren't going to pick one and you've decided just to ignore that advice, I would at least put English first because then you are going out to a wider audience. So having a look at your post, again, this is just an English post and I see that you've tried to get some engagement here. I like it, I like the idea of it. Questions are an amazing way of baiting engagement. Here you've said, I'm already to clean my apartment. I don't know, how long do you take to start cleaning? I can see what you're trying to do. It's going to bait engagement. It might be just kind of like, um, an engagement bait where people will think, why should I tell you? Why should I comment? Why should I be the first person to comment? What I would do is flip this and give a little bit of an anecdote of your day or the reason why you are procrastinating because everyone can relate to this. When it comes to cleaning, we can relate to procrastination. So saying why you've procrastinated or whether it's a problem that you have and you're trying to improve it, something where people can relate to it, get people to relate and then go in for the engagement bait by asking a question because you've got them to invest in you and you've got them to essentially invest in this one post and therefore they don't mind commenting. So after they've read it, they relate to it and then they see the question and they do feel like commenting. So that is the only tweak I would do there. But Let's have a look at your YouTube as well, because I think that is a great way to try and get a, a, a new audience using their algorithm. So I can see that things haven't really took off yet. You've been posting for five months and you've got 54 subscribers. Now, this number may seem small, but it's YouTube. One view equals like a hundred views on Instagram. It is that much more significant, especially as when people are consuming the content, they are a lot more engaged. So I see that you've been posting a combination of covers, vlogs, some is in French, some is in English. Again, I would pick one, especially for the YouTube algorithm, because it won't know whether your channel is English and French and push it out to France or push it out to UK, USA, Australia, Canada, Ireland, those kind of places. So I would say keep investing and don't be put off by only having 54 subscribers. You're only at the beginning. My formula for a YouTube channel is you firstly need to know where your initial views are going to come from, because you're, if you're creating vlogs that going to be about you and you only. And you need to think where are the new people going to discover you because they're not going to see a random guy and decide to click it and see what he did that day. There's got to be something in it for them in the early stages. So the first thing you need to do when starting a channel is finding how you're going to add value and how people are going to discover you. They do that by external places like Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, and also the search function. So 
initially you want to create topics where people are searching for it and you can be niche about it. You can talk about your experiences with staying motivated, talk about procrastination and how you found this one unique way to beat procrastination. And don't think that you need to create content like this and just talking to camera and giving advice. There are plenty of YouTubers out there who will give one piece of advice but combine it with a vlog. So they are talking in lots of different locations and then they tell the story throughout the entire vlog as they go about their day. So that's fine, but people searching for it and click it for that one reason. Think about it, why would people click? Or you could talk about like relationships or how to get over a breakup or maybe your crush rejected you then think about things that people can relate to and maybe watching as well and get yourself in the suggested videos. The next thing to do is if you have something niche, then you can go to places like Reddit and Facebook groups and post your video in there and find people who are already talking about this topic and then they are likely to discover you and your content. Once you have that, once you have those initial subscribers, you can start to branch out and rely on the algorithm and try to get yourself in suggested videos. But if you wanna start a channel, you need to be niche. You need to make videos which have a title that people want to click. It's not just kind of like an arty title that describes what happens in your vlog. And finally, let's have a quick look at your TikTok. So TikTok, as Maddie will said in her videos, we see it all the time, and by the way, if you're not subscribed to our channel and you, if you're interested in music marketing and growing yourself as an artist, then do subscribe because we are uploading every single week and we're gonna be doing a lot more of these style videos if it's popular, as well as giving out the latest advice in music marketing. So looking at your TikTok here, the first thing that I've noticed is you don't put any titles whatsoever and it is the text on the TikTok is what gets people to stop initially. If you think about how quickly people scroll on TikTok, it is crazy. So that initial text, when you put the caption, just like your Instagram caption, it needs to be something quite clickbaity that gets people to stop scrolling and watch initially. The next thing you need to do is, I've noticed that your TikToks are quite slow paced. You've almost just like ripped it from somewhere else or not much is happening and you need things to happen quickly. So here, you've simply just ripped something from your vlog on YouTube, and that is never going to work. You need to make TikTok friendly content. And what needs to happen is, something needs to happen in the first three seconds. So you've got your caption, hooks people in. Something in the first three seconds gets people invested. Something will get them invested or something happens. Then, after 15 seconds, you need something that is going to be a punchline or something else to happen, depending on how long it is. It's either 15 seconds or up to 30, 30 seconds. So something else needs to happen. Caption, three seconds and 15 seconds, or if it's the end, needs to get the like. The more likes you get, the higher the algorithm is going to push you out. So you need something at the end that's going to get the likes, which is a motion or a punchline or something that makes the whole video worth watching. People are trigger happy with TikTok and are desperate just to scroll to the next one. So you've got to keep people engaged constantly and just literally imagine they've got ADHD. Okay, let's move on to the next one and squeeze one more in. So MTTS has emailed in, given us a breakdown of Instagram strategy. So MTTS says that he's got a ongoing theme that his Instagram is completely blue and has tropical vibes and he's worried about breaking that because it makes it very, very difficult to post when it doesn't fit that vibe. And I think this does cause a lot of issues if you have an ongoing theme. And the worst thing I see is when people create grids. I hate that when you have one big picture across a huge grid, it makes no sense and it only looks good for people who are considering following you, but even though they're not gonna follow you because all you do is post just like a picture of your ear and like a corner of the grid. It just, it makes no sense. The answer to the question is yes, break it. Think about the user experience in terms of when they are scrolling. What do they see individually? I know a lot of influencers do like to have a color palette and get things right and make their whole profile look amazing, but 
people aren't going to follow or not follow because you've got a theme going. You need to have a good experience where they know that when they click follow, something like that is going to hit their feed and they don't care what color it is or what ongoing theme it is. They just want to be able to rely on it being good content. So when people are scrolling, it is something they want to see and something they can engage with. He also asked about guerrilla marketing and had the idea of giving out flyers which had a QR code to go and stream his track or go and see him live or something like that. And to be totally honest, I don't like the idea. Sorry, I think that most people don't wanna get out their phones, get a QR code app. I think maybe it's inbuilt under some phones, but people don't really know that. And then they have to go and find the link and they don't even know what they are going for. What I would recommend instead is if you are promoting a live event, a lot of people give out flyers. One thing we did for a client at Burstamo, which was pretty sneaky, uh, we had a client who was adv who was supporting a very big artist on one night. And what we did was we went and created an ad just for that location. And we had a speculation of what the first song was going to be and what the encore was going to be for this big artist. And we knew that everyone in that location who liked that artist, who watched that entire video was going there that night. So when they actually, af so the support artist played, they watched the, then he gave a shout out for his Instagram. No one followed, they often don't. And then they watched, on the night, the big artist, and then they went home. The following night, we then retargeted with a video of that artist to everyone who watched the entire video of the encore being leaked or the set list being leaked. So we know that those people went and saw the artist support and were wondering who it was. And then suddenly they get a promo video for that artist and we're able to very precisely target everyone who went there that night. And the likelihood is they went and followed and he got lots more followers through that who they had seen as li him live and now will go and consider going to one of his shows. So that's the kind of things we like to think about. Instead of physical, what are people doing online? What are people doing on their phones? The next question was, do you have to stick to a genre? And because you've got two different genres, tropical house or deep house. For me, I would say pick one and stick to it. I know that you've got lots of different inspirations, lots of different ideas. One thing that popped into my head when I saw this question is, I've never heard this before, but is it possible to have two stage names, two totally different artists, and just see which one takes off for you. Release music under two different artist names, under two different genres, and just stick to the one that takes off. That's what I would do in your position. And the final question you had was about SoundCloud, whether it's, it's still relevant. I would say yes, it still has a huge user base. And I don't know too much about SoundCloud at Burstamo. We don't use it for promoting artists. We just use it for hosting files and sending it out but I have known artists have a huge amount of success by getting other large artists to share their music on SoundCloud. So it does work, it is effective, but it's not something I'll be doing a video on anytime soon because we only do videos on things where we've had success in that area. And to be honest on SoundCloud, it's not something we focus on. Thanks very much for everyone who's submitted. We've still got loads more to get through. And again, give me feedback on this video. What do you think? Should we do more videos like this? Or would you like us to stick to videos where we simply just give you strategies and tips that you can do to promote your music, but not necessarily applying it to a specific artist? If you are going to send in a submission, please keep your questions to your specific strategy as an artist rather than general questions. We'll keep general questions for things like Instagram Lives, YouTube Lives, and just general Q and A's that we do. So if you want to submit your question, follow us on Instagram because we're gonna put up more stories like that. Also, if you want further insight, join our music industry Slack group where there's lots of artists, musicians, the Burstamo team, people from the industry. And if you have questions, you can get help there. So I'll leave the link in the description if you want to apply to join that. Hope you found this video useful. If you have, give it a thumbs up and of course, subscribe if you're not already and we'll see you in the next video.